I'll go ahead and start. Um, so good morning, you guys, or afternoon for some of you guys uh, who are out in the East Coast. Uh, thank you for joining us on our expert series talk. Um, so like this series, we started to help students get engaged into science and get to know a little bit about research, um, and especially because sometimes they don't know that's like a path that they can be able to take. Um, so that's why one of the reasons that we did this is so people, people could be able to get a little bit more engaged in, in science and the research and why doing these types of research um, is really important uh, to our ecosystem. Uh, so today I have the pleasure of introducing um, our expert series uh, guest, uh, which is uh, Cheko Colon Wad. Um, so he is a professor of biology and associate dean of the Jack N. Averitt College of uh, uh, Graduate Studies at Georgia Southern University. Cheko is an aquatic ecologist who studies the role of uh, consumers in organic matter uh, processing and ecosystem functions. Uh, Cheko is also invested in efforts to broaden participants and increase diversity at all career stages in freshwater science. Uh, Cheko earned a doctoral degree in zoology from Southern Illinois University, a master's in fisheries from uh, Louisiana State University, and a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of uh, te uh, Texas at uh, El Paso. Um, but I also want to include that Checo is also a great mentor, um, even though he has, he's not my mentor, but he's definitely has mentored me over the past uh, couple of years um, and has tried to get me more into freshwater science as well. Um, and I'm very glad to have Checo do uh, this talk today. Thank you, Anita. And, uh, and I, I just want to check with the folks that are on Zoom, if you can hear me well. You put a, a thumbs up on your screen, or you could just write in the chat. There you go. And then I'm o I'm also gonna ask uh, uh, folks to use the chat uh, to ask questions and to interact. I'm 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 a very uh, chatty person. There you go. Maxine could hear me. I'm a very chatty person, so so I could kind of go off uh, into you know into Wonderland. So so please be sure to to talk to me on the chat. And the first thing I'll ask. It's like if you could tell me, uh, you know, just just where you're connecting from and, you know, where you're from or, or what stage of your career you might be at. If you're a high school student or a college student or a post back or something like that, you can let me know in the chat. And then I'm also going to start sharing screen for a little bit. Let's see. All right. So hopefully you could all see my screen. I'll ask for another thumbs up again. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so like Anita said, I, I, I am uh, uh, currently at Georgia Southern University. That's, uh, that's in Statesboro, Georgia, so East Coast. So it's afternoon for me, just a little bit after one. Uh, and, and I'm uh, super excited to get the opportunity to participate in this expert talk series. Uh, I've, been, I've been able to work with Anita now, I think this is over seven years uh, in a venue similar to what I'll talk about today. And, and just for the most part, uh, again, I, I, I want to have the, the opportunity to share more of a pathway or more of a career experience uh, and, and how kind of I got here and try to link that to things that we're trying to do to really increase diversity in, in STEM and, and particularly in freshwater science or in conservation and aquatic sciences. Uh, and then I also argue that this is, let me see if I could kind of maybe use some sort of pointer uh, maybe I won't, but uh, but the, the key here is that uh, I do have my email address out here, and I know this is something that Anita could share, so if anybody wants to get a hold of me, uh, you could always contact me by email, and, and at the at the request of my of my my teenage daughters, uh, I'm also sharing uh, my, my social media, so if you want to, you want to contact me that way, uh, another good venue to find me. Uh, so real quickly, let's see, make sure I'm in the right screen. So like Anita mentioned, I'm, I'm an aquatic ecologist, but most of my work really comes in aquatic entomology or working with aquatic invertebrates. So, so when I see a picture like this one, which would be a, a, a good chunk of my work, this, this is the kind of image that gets me really excited about the type of science that, that I do. 
uh, when I look at a picture like this, for me as somebody that works with, with aquatic organisms, this picture shows me a lot of diversity. It shows me a lot of, again, you know, different organisms, different taxonomic groups, uh, different, different roles that organisms could play in aquatic systems. Uh, again, in a picture like this, I'm seeing everything from mollusks to, uh, to different insect uh, orders and different taxa like caddisflies, mayflies, some larval uh, dipterans, so the true flies. And I'm also seeing things like beetles and, and, and you know, a, a lot of different groups that we tend to associate with, with good biodiversity. And the reason why a picture like this gets me excited is because we use our knowledge of the life history of many of these groups and, and our knowledge of their diversity to tell us a good bit about the conditions, the quality or the health of our habitats. And a lot of times we associate high levels of diversity to, to very healthy, very well-functioning habitats and ecosystems. And the key is that at most sites, we tend to find uh, that, that a few species tend to dominate and be very common, whereas many species tend to be rare, rarely found. Most of, most of the diversity tends to be really things that, that we don't find too many of, whereas the very common things tend to be very abundant and, and you know, very easily found. So, so I, I'll try to link a little bit of, of the punchline or the story that I'm trying to tell with the interest that we have as biologists or as ecologists to really understanding diversity. Uh, now, before I do that, I want to kind of tell you a little bit about what got me to, to where I am at today, uh, my career as an aquatic ecologist, my career as a professor, and how it all started and what particular uh, turns or paths along the way were really significant or meaningful in me choosing this career. Uh, so to do that, I'll, I have to link to the fact that a lot of my interest in the field and in the science comes from being outside and spending a lot of time in the field, a lot of time outdoors, a lot of time like, like really enjoying nature or being outside in, in, in a forest or in a habitat or next to a river or in the ocean or something like that. And I, I like to show this picture because this is a picture of me. This is around circa about 2009 or so. When, when I was a, a, a postdoc, I had just finished my PhD and I was spending time working as a, as a postdoctoral research fellow. And, and I was at a site, this is in North Carolina in the Appalachian Mountains. This is a site called Coweta. Uh, and, and I like to show this picture because I am extremely happy, extremely excited to be at this site because it was my first time at a place that I read a lot about. I, I studied and, and read a lot of papers about this particular location and this particular area. This is, this is a, a Cossackton wheel. This is a place where even though you can't see it because all the leaves, there's actually water flowing through a device that I'm standing right next to. And this particular site in North Carolina called the Kawita Long-Term Ecological Research Station is part of a system or a network of, of many long-term ecological research sites uh, within the continental US and elsewhere. So uh, if, if you are not familiar, uh, the National Science Foundation has a system or a network of long-term ecological research sites. Uh, and again, and this is a picture of about 22 of them uh, around the continental U.S. and all the way to Alaska, and there are some others that we've had over the years in the, in the Arctic and Antarctic. But, but again, I was excited to be at that site. This is the one where I was at that picture in North Carolina, because at the time, I wanted to visit as many LTER sites as I could. So, you, so you could think of, you could think about it in a way. Uh, if you have a hobby, let's say that that you like to go to to different baseball stadiums, or if you like to go to like different theme parks or something like that, or national parks, uh, which I like too. At that time, I was trying to visit as many LTER sites as I could to just see them, to just appreciate the research that had gone on over the years, or just to have an opportunity to connect with scientists. So at that point, I think Kawira at the time was about my 10th site visited. So I was very excited to see it. So, so I'll talk about that. Now I have to go a little bit, uh, uh, I guess, much earlier than that, and and I and I attribute a lot of like my reasoning for this career was was the way that I grew up. I grew up in Puerto Rico, a, a small island in the Caribbean, uh, very very uh, uh, unique island in terms of its features. 
And when I was when I was young, growing up in the island as a little kid, I did spend a lot of time outside. Here's here's a picture that I would argue with my parents that I'm out there in some coast or some beach somewhere uh, sampling uh, in the water with like my benthic sippy cup. And, and again, and you could tell like in that image that I'm just as happy or just as ecstatic as I would have been in the picture before when I was already in my 20s and close to 30s studying as a postdoc scientist. Now, a couple of things that, that, that I think I, I like to connect back from the island is that Puerto Rico is a small island. This is about 30 miles from north to south and about 100 miles from west to east. But you could tell right in the middle in the topography of the island, there is a central mountain region, right, that, that feeds from like, you know, from west coast to east coast or right through the middle of the island, like Cordillera Central, most of the mountains in Puerto Rico, right through the middle. And right in that mountain area is where most rivers originate. So a lot of the rivers in Puerto Rico, they start their tributaries, their beginnings, right, their, their, their starting points are in those mountains. And they have a very short distance to travel to get to the ocean or to get to the Caribbean Sea. And in an island like Puerto Rico that, that has a, 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 a lot of inhabitants, that creates a lot of challenges when dealing with freshwater conservation and, and human use of fresh water. And because of that, a lot of the rivers in Puerto Rico have been impounded. They have large reservoirs or large dams where water consumption or, or water conservation for human use is one of the, like, the major challenges of the island. So I didn't think about that as a kid, but again, it made me appreciate my career growing up with an interest in freshwater science. So, so as I grew up in Puerto Rico and I, after I went through high school and, and one year of college in the island, I did what, what most you know, teenagers or so, or, or young kids, uh, young adults do. I went as far as possible as I could from my island, and I ended up pursuing uh, college opportunities at the University of Texas, El Paso. So, so I left my tropical island, and I went to the Southwest uh, to study at, at El Paso, Texas. And, and I like to point out, like, when I left Puerto Rico, I did not leave with the, with the intention already to pursue biology. In fact, I came to El Paso, Texas as a, as a you know, general studies major. And, and when I started to get exposure to these new systems, new ecosystems from the tropics to the desert side, Southwest, I, I kind of rekindled my passion for being outdoors and for environmental science. And, and again, in, in being in El Paso, really was was a very different image to what I was used to uh, from, from growing up in the tropics. As I started to get exposure to desert ecosystems, I then again started to appreciate a lot more uh, the, the, the intention of studying conservation of aquatic systems or studying water. Now, one other thing that I'll mention about moving from Puerto Rico to El Paso, I didn't realize that at the time, but the fact that UTEP is an MSI or a minority servant institution where the vast majority of students are Hispanic, uh, not just when I was there, but also now, that that was really meaningful because most of my colleagues, my classmates, some of my faculty, some of the staff, again, you know, we had that, that, that connection in common. We, could, we, we all kind of, uh, you know, looked alike, uh, spoke the same language, although relatively different uh, 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 accents. But, but again, that connection to my colleagues and being able to turn around and see people that were pursuing similar values or similar goals that sounded like me, looked like me, and had the same type of background as me was, was relatively meaningful. I didn't think about that uh, from growing up in the island to move into the U.S. So, so being in El Paso uh, was really a connection that kind of kept me engaged with me seeing myself. Uh, in a career or pursuing something that, that was very similar to what my colleagues were doing. The other thing in El Paso that, that was interesting is that when I went to El Paso, it was far enough from home that during the summers or what, once school was out of the regular fall and spring semesters, I couldn't go back home. It was just too far. It was not affordable. So I had to figure out what I was going to do while I was away for college. And, and fortunately for me, my, my uh, professors and, and my mentors and advisors pointed me in the direction of opportunities for, for doing research during the summers. So from my first to second and, and, and third summer and so on, 
I had the opportunity to participate in a program called Research Experiences for Undergraduates, or REU. And I think, you know, you know, perhaps uh, folks in the audience might be familiar with it. Give me a thumbs up if you are familiar with the REU, or Research Experience for Undergraduates program. But during my time as an undergraduate, this was perhaps the most meaningful experience that I had that connected me to the future that I wanted to pursue, even this early as a, as a college student, the future that I wanted to pursue, where I had a chance to get, to get exposed to the research process from beginning to end and really have opportunities that I didn't know, uh, I was not aware that, that were out there as potential career choices. Uh, my experience with the REU, uh, gave me my first exposure to the National Science Foundation or the NSF, uh, perhaps the major federal funding venue or sponsor for research uh, in the U.S. And it also gave me my first exposure again to that LTER or Long-Term Ecological Research Network that I mentioned. Uh, my first experience uh, uh, in, an, in an REU was, uh, was in Washington, D.C., so I got a little bit of exposure to the, to the National Science Foundation, but then on a second experience, I spent time at the Concept Prairie Biological Station, which is one of those LTER sites in, in uh, near Manhattan, Kansas. So, so again, I think uh, if from, from going from Puerto Rico to El Paso, Texas, to then having a chance to, to spend time in, in, in Kansas was, was quite uh, unique. There's not anything that I would imagine I had the chance to do. Uh, again, probably at that point, my only my only my only connection to Kansas would have been something like the Wizard of Oz or something like that. But again, in this experience, I got a chance to work outside, work in rivers. This is this picture is me working at a site called uh, Kings Creek in Kansas Prairie, one of their main tributaries. And what I'm doing out there is I am sampling, I am creating spaces or kind of chambers in the in the river to grow invertebrates and, and one particular group of invertebrates, uh, a type of like true flies, midges or, or dipterans in the coronamid uh, family. So, so again, so I was hooked about the opportunity to be outside, do research and pursue this as a potential career Thankfully, because of the exposure that I got to this REU or Research Experience for Undergraduates program, I got to work with faculty mentors, I got to meet with graduate students, and, and it kind of gave me an idea of, uh, okay, this is something that I would like to continue to pursue. So when I finished my summers and, and went back to El Paso, Texas, and, and was completing my degree, I knew that the, the logical next step for me was to pursue graduate school in something related to uh, water or something related to being outdoors. So I was fortunate enough when I graduated from UTEP, I was, a, I was admitted into a fisheries and natural resources program at Louisiana State University in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I got now exposure and the opportunity to work uh, with another great federal funding agency and great entity in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So as a graduate student in Louisiana State, I worked as a co-op in, in, in a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service unit at the university. So it gave me a lot of exposure to the type of work that federal and also state agencies will do uh, in their mission to protect and restore our natural resources. Uh, so in this picture, you see me out here, I'm mainly uh, uh, <laughs> hanging on to like some, some uh, larger game fish. So it kind of gives you the impression, even though I was in a fisheries program, that I was mainly studying fish. But most of what I was doing was studying the diets of those fish and studying those diets when they were very young, when they were young of the year type fish. And as they grew and they shifted from a diet that was mainly or primarily focused on invertebrates, to then moving to a more like carnivorous diet where they're, where they're feeding on other fish and, and, and other larger organisms. So my time at Louisiana State University not only exposed me to conservation from a more applied approach, but it kind of gave me the exposure to all these other different funding agencies and entities that really play a role in the conservation of our natural resources. Uh, so when my time came up at Louisiana State and I, was, uh, I had uh, a good bit of exposure into the, the, the type of work that I wanted to do in water conservation and freshwater, I was pretty much ready to go to the workforce. I was finishing my degree. 
And I was starting to look for jobs where I could use my master's degree as, as a way to, to land a job, perhaps in a federal agency or, or in a state agency. And one of the things that I did is I started contacting some of my previous advisors, some of my previous professors, and I had a chance to contact uh, one of my mentors during the research experience for the grads during the REU program and applied for a technician position that he had available in the laboratory. And, uh, and when I applied, he reached back out to me and said, like, you know, I have a doctoral position, a PhD position available. Were you ever thinking or considering pursuing a PhD? And at the time, I have to be honest, I think a lot of my uh, uh, insecurities in terms of pursuing a PhD were based on the fact that I was a minority student. Whereas, whereas in UTEP, I felt like everybody around me was, they were also minority students and minorities pursuing the same job. When I moved to Louisiana State, that wasn't the case anymore, right? I was, I was the minority student there where most people that were going to the next stage to the total degrees or, to, or to, to pursue more graduate school now where they didn't look like me, talk like me, sound like me, or had the same background as me. And I also worried that, again, you know, my, my, my first language being Spanish, I felt like I wasn't prepared to kind of get to the next stage and kind of compete with, with some of the colleagues that I knew were pursuing those degrees. Well, it turned out that the opportunity that, that I had reached out about, all those same insecurities that I had turned into strengths for the particular program that I was being invited to apply for, because then I got a chance to work as a doctoral student in Central America through a university in the US. So, so I was admitted into the Department of Zoology in a PhD program at Southern Illinois University, where I got to spend a good chunk of my time as a PhD student working in Central America, working in Panama, working again with the National Science Foundation as the main sponsor, but primarily with the Smithsonian Institute and the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in, in Panama uh, to, to pursue uh, studies of amphibian declines through that entire Central America, all the way to South America through the Isthmus of Panama. So I was, I was able to work in, in, in a largely collaborative project. Uh, you could probably see me in the back. I'm like that, you know, I'm, I'm brown, so you could almost not see me, but I'm the one putting the bunny ears on his advisor. But the entire group out here uh, consisted of people from Costa Rica, Jamaica, the US, uh, you know, England, a very diverse group of scientists coming together uh, through the National Science Foundation and through the Smithsonian Institute on a similar goal. And in this particular scenario, we were studying the, the effects of losing diversity in an ecosystem. If you, if you are familiar, like throughout the last few decades, we've lost a, a large amount of anurin diversity and amphibians primarily uh, that, are, that are stream dwelling or they're associated with, with water bodies. Uh, and this is mainly has been done not just to things like habitat loss, uh, associate things to like you know land use change, but in this particular scenario, it was it was a noble disease. It was it was a chytrid fungus that was wiping out most of the frog populations uh, through Central America and predictably moving south. Uh, so I was able to work with this group and use my expertise at the time and in, in, in apply fisheries and natural resource science. Uh, to, to, to measure the response of invertebrates in the systems that now were, were trying to compensate from the loss of, uh, of larval anurans or larval amphibians, mainly, mainly frog tadpoles in aquatic systems in Central America. So that was a great experience. It was something that, that allowed me to see a different picture of not just the research that I was doing, but also doing it in a very interdisciplinary approach, very collaborative, and, and with groups that, that were very, very diverse, a lot of different groups of people sharing their expertise and, and sharing their knowledge, kind of coming together to make that, that group stronger. So that was a great experience. I finished my PhD uh, uh, in, in, at Southern Illinois University. And, and as I was looking for opportunities to stay engaged in this type of field, uh, I was able to land back in my, in my home island in Puerto Rico as a postdoc to study the rivers in Puerto Rico at the University of Puerto Rico's Institute for Tropical Ecosystem Studies. Uh, at that time, uh, I, I had the opportunity to work with 
Uh, another great mentor, another uh, uh, Hispanic or Latino scientist in Dr. Alonso Ramirez, who is now at, at North Carolina State University. So it really kind of brought me back to thinking like, wow, like some of the things that I didn't anticipate growing up in an island and growing up again in, in, in a place where there was there was a need for understanding natural resources and, and the, the, the use and conservation of water brings me back not only to the island to provide that expertise, but working with somebody again that, that resembled the type of leadership approach and, and, and the type of like cultural background that I grew up in. And then interestingly enough, again, when I was in Puerto Rico, I got to work at another one of those long-term ecological research sites, uh, the only uh, uh, rain, tropical rainforest uh, long-term ecological research site in, in that system or that network from the National Science Foundation. So that was, again, you know, a, 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 a very uh, uh, instrumental, I think, set of experiences for me to not just get exposure to the type of work that I wanted to do, but also bring back some of that expertise to my island and bring back some of that expertise to mentor students from the island that might have had the same type of interest as I had growing up. Now, uh, after, after completing my time as a postdoc, I was fortunate enough to, to land my, my job at Georgia Southern University, where, where I've been ever since uh, and, and where I'm still today, 13 years later, and, and getting the chance to do this type of research in, in again, in, in, in an area of the land where, where water resources, water conservation, and diversity of aquatic systems and aquatic uh, organisms is, uh, is, is an incredible hot zone or hot spot for, for studying this type of work. Uh, here, I mainly study coastal plain rivers uh, along the southeastern coastal plain or along the southeast, primarily in Georgia. Here's a map of Georgia towards like the left of, uh, of this picture. And, and here I am at the, at the Ogeechee River, which is the river in our backyard. This is relatively close, about 30 minutes from our campus. And the neat thing out here is that these rivers are, are very unique. They're, we call them blackwater rivers. They have low retention. Uh, a few of them uh, are, are, are entirely free flowing, which is very rare globally. Like most of our rivers globally have had some sort of alteration hydrologically, like in impoundments and in dams. But uh, some of our rivers out here still maintain uh, the same free flowing conditions they, they would have had naturally. However, some of them don't. Uh, the border of Georgia and North Carolina uh, encompasses the Savannah River, which is, which is a, a, a river that has large impoundments, large dams, a large port, one of the largest ports of entry uh, in the Southeast US. So it does have a lot of human impact and human demand, but parallel to that same river, there are a lot of water bodies that we can now compare and contrast the effects of human use uh, in these rivers and these systems over decades, and you could argue that even centuries. Uh, now, another neat thing about working in, in the Southeast is that I also get to work in, in a series of very unique barrier islands and, and marsh habitats, one of them being Sapelo Island, which is another one of those long-term ecological research sites. We do have one in our backyard called the Georgia Coastal Ecosystem, and it allows me to address some other pressing issues in terms of the nature of our ecosystems along the lines of freshwater and now a little bit of estuarine and, and, and marine science. And one of the things that we are now experiencing or at least alerting for is the potential for sea level rise resulting in saltwater intrusion and a shift in freshwater habitats or traditionally freshwater habitats that are now getting a little bit more of an influence uh, from from uh, from marine environments and from saltwater environments, so that will result in a change in the way the systems function. So my students and I are spending a good bit of time studying the potential shifts in communities and the potential shifts in diversity when you lose a system that has been freshwater, traditionally freshwater for a certain period of time, that now gets a little bit more of an influence from saltwater. Now uh, I'll kind of. I kind of leave it at that in terms of like just my my, my uh, primary research or, or just my my, uh, my my basic science, and I'll shift the theme a little bit to try to connect to something that I think is just equally important in 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 really influencing my career as a scientist, 
And I talked about diversity mostly in my work and how I'm and many of my colleagues are interested in diversity within the ecosystems that we study. Me as an aquatic scientist, I'm always looking at, uh, into the scope and trying to understand you know, diversity in terms of macroinvertebrates or diversity in terms of fish, amphibians, whatever that might be. But a lot of times that same importance or that same value that we place on diversity in those ecosystems doesn't necessarily translate to the diversity of those that are working or the workforce within those ecosystems. So I'll try to phrase the next stage of my talk, uh, not just about diversity below the water as an aquatic scientist, but also the value of that diversity above the water, the diversity of the scientific community, those that are doing the work, the workforce in terms of like any dimension of diversity and how they contribute to us being a, a, a more functional uh, community of scientists. And a lot of that I phrase within the context of broadening participation. And, and when I talk about broadening participation, what I mean is really nurturing talent wherever that might be found and, and really investing in efforts to develop that talent and promote the diversity and the inclusion, the equity of that talent in the accessibility of resources, whether that is you know, studying, whether that is programming, whether that is just funding uh, to, a, to a very diverse community of scientists. And part of this requires that we go outside of our traditional means for really bringing people into our science, but really like searching a little bit beyond the boundaries, whether that be geographic, institutional, demographic, and so on. Now, uh, I, I know I don't necessarily need to bring much of an argument beyond why it is important to broaden participation, but for one, just from my own experiences and things that, that I know we're able to see, we know that having a very diverse community of scientists is going to make for a stronger community uh, of, of not just researchers, but also stakeholders that are now providing and engaging in the science building capacity for all the people that is eventually going to result in building capacity for the ecosystems that we conserve, manage, and the quality of life because of those ecosystems that we live in, and arguably because it also helps us in terms of making better decisions and providing greater strength, greater engagement, greater innovation to conserve our ecosystem. So, so it brings me back to like, well, why, why was this important in terms of like my career pathway? Well, if I think back of uh, when I started graduate school and when I was trying to pursue careers in fisheries, particularly my, my transition from an undergraduate in UT El Paso uh, to my time in Louisiana, is that I was starting to see that the, the community that I was serving, right, the, the citizens and, and, and uh, the, the population that I was serving, and even traditionally, if we look beyond you know, the US census uh, uh, nationally, but also regionally, we didn't necessarily see the workforce resemble the same type of diversity uh, that we had in, in, in the community. So for all the, 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 the scientists or the positions or, or the, 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 yeah, I guess at that point, the, the fisheries biologists that I was engaging with, not a lot of them really uh, looked like me or provided the representation that I thought would be important for me to think that I had a career in that field. And we could argue over the years, here's data from, from Ivan Arismendi and Ruth Penaluna uh, in a paper they published in 2016. And even though this is 2010 data, we arguably don't see the same diversity, even when we think about those that are providing the training and the education and the preparation for future scientists, uh, of those that are earning doctoral degrees or advanced degrees, and particularly here in the, in the field of fisheries biology, not a lot of them were really turning into uh, that mentoring or that leadership role that we see in the professorate or in the academic in the academic world or even in the federal fisheries management and scientist venue. And those numbers haven't changed that much, even if we go 10 years past the data that, that Ivan and Brooke were using, we still see a, a, a very low representation uh, in the workforce of, of underrepresented minority scientists and, and minority PhDs or, or advanced degree scientists, whether it's in fisheries or in natural resource science. Arguably, that's, that's probably about the same of what we see in terms of academics. Uh, although the population of students 
tends to resemble uh, the U.S. population in terms of the demographic uh, makeup. We don't necessarily see that same makeup in terms of the academics, the professors, the, the instructors, the lecturers that, that are teaching those classes. So, so technically for me to be in, in a position at Georgia Southern at, as, a, as a professor, it, it was, it's relatively rare in my field, not just in, in, in natural resource conservation, but primarily in STEMs and in, in just general environmental science. Uh, so, so I thought that that was, that was something that, that if I had the chance to use my role or use my, my platform to provide some opportunities or provide ways to maybe shift uh, uh, the way that, that, that we build our, our workforce, then I, I try to think of ways that for what worked for me could potentially work for others. So what worked for me and in, in, in how am I trying to approach this as opportunities, even if it's just providing exposure information uh, uh, to shift the, the demographic diversity of our workforce. Uh, perhaps the most important uh, experience or most meaningful experience that I had during my academic preparation was my exposure to the research experiences for undergraduates program or the REU program through the National Science Foundation. Uh, that was incredibly meaningful for me. I think that experience really provided me very hands-on exposure and in, uh, in, in, in a good representation of what it meant to be a scientist. Uh, so, so for the past, I want to say probably 11 years or so, I've worked with the National Science Foundation uh, either as a, as a panelist, as a reviewer, and now for the last five years as a, as a, as a host or, or a, a, a PI in my own uh, REU site here at Georgia Southern, but also a big promoter to over 127 biology REU sites across the US. Uh, our particular REU site here at Georgia Southern uh, really exposes uh, uh, young scientists to coastal plain science, to the resources of the coastal plain. It's kind of very Southeast focused, but we do bring in students from, from across the nation to, to take part in this program, which is a compensated program where students spend 10 weeks uh, working with research mentors and 10 weeks where they are getting housing, uh, uh, options and meal plans, covering their travel. And on top of that, they get a stipend. The rate of stipends for bio REU sites now are about $600 a week. And again, you're living together with, with other students that are experiencing and, and sharing that mission or that vision of what you wanna do uh, uh, professionally and try to get that exposure for your career. So I do try to pitch a lot the type of work that we do. And it's not just research. We get a lot of exposure to some of the local natural resources. Uh, we do work in collaboration with other sites. Here are our 10 students uh, uh, in a shared or cross-program collaboration with a program at Auburn University uh, in, in also in the Southeast in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, we do get out to, to important research sites. This is the Okefenokee. Ok National Wildlife Refuge, also in Southeast Georgia, closer to the border of Florida and Georgia. This is an important wetland ecosystem. But what we're doing out here is that this is a site that is managed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So we are exposing the students, not just to the habitats, not just to the ecosystems, but also to potential career opportunities in venues and in agencies like the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Natural Resources, and so on. Uh, they do spend a lot of time getting exposure to really hands-on conservation and restoration. This is us working with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, uh, building uh, oyster reefs, so like building living shorelines to prevent erosion in some of these marsh habitats and these barrier islands. So they are getting exposure to the type of work that really means uh, conservation and management really hands-on. Uh, we are giving them exposure to, to again, techniques for sampling. Uh, they, they are learning about fisheries. They are learning about the natural history of ecosystems. They are learning about uh, uh, sustainable agriculture, so on and so on. And yes, towards the end of the program, uh, they clean up nice and they present their work in a nice poster session where now they get exposure to dissemination of work and scientific communication. I do tend to give a pitch to our program. This is every summer. Uh, usually, again, most programs throughout the U.S., uh, they tend to resemble whatever the summer timeline or the summer semester might be for, for academic institutions. 
So whereas our starts right around the middle of May, those programs out in the West Coast, usually, for example, like near the California uh, 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 school system or university systems, they, they tend to start right around June and run all the way until August. Uh, again, you know, uh, a pitch for a program here, but if you are interested in, if you're an undergraduate interested in getting research exposure, I do encourage you to just Google uh, National Science Foundation REU sites, or National Science Foundation REU or Bio REU, and you'll have a list or an array of over 127 sites. This is right around the timeline where, where most programs start to recruit application systems tend to open right around December and they run all the way until March uh, for, for opportunities uh, for, for the next summer, for, for summer of 2023. And again, it, it, whether you are a freshman or whether you are a senior, as long as you're still gonna be enrolled in, in, in college as an undergraduate in the fall of 2023, you are eligible for these programs. And I do encourage you to look at them and, and, and potentially apply if you have a chance. And you could apply, it's free to apply. So apply for as many as possible. Now, another thing that really uh, influenced my career was really getting exposure to professional scientific societies uh, in, in, in many, many different societies uh, from an undergraduate all the way to like now as a professional. Uh, I, I've, been, I've been able and fortunate enough to be involved in various academic and professional scientific societies ranging from the American Fisheries Society to uh, at the time when I was an undergraduate, just, just broader societies uh, uh, that just looked at general biology. But now I've been doing most of my business in the Society for Freshwater Science. Uh, uh, that's the venue where, where I usually uh, uh, do most of my programming or my students do most of their, their scientific presentations and, and attend meetings. And fortunately enough, uh, about about 11 years ago, in, in 2011, just just after after finishing my my postdoc and when I first started my career as a professor, I was fortunate to be able to launch a program that provided travel opportunities and travel fellowships for minority undergrads to attend our conference or to attend our national yearly meeting. Uh, the program is called Instars. Instars uh, again, you know, if you think about this from a from a, from a science geeky or buggy geeky standpoint, it just means different life stages, right? So like, like organisms go through different instars as they mature and develop into becoming adults. So we name our program instars. And what we do is we provide the opportunity for students that are just interested in freshwater science uh, to apply for funding support, to attend the meeting. So this allows them to, to spend uh, the, about a week of a conference uh, in different venues. This changes every, every summer when we meet is usually around late May. And since 2011, this program has supported over 130 undergraduates to attend the meeting, but also supported graduate students as mentors that are already affiliated with the society. And they're coming in and serving as peer mentors uh, to new undergraduates that might be interested in getting exposure or already interested in pursuing a career in freshwater science. So this was very exciting because this society allowed me a platform for directly infusing diversity into the membership of our society. And, and again, and this is not unique of the Society for Freshwater Science, uh, other societies, aquatic and otherwise in environmental science and even in microbiology or you name it, uh, do have similar programs. I was fortunate enough to kind of be, be part of the, of the, the founding force of, uh, of the one for the Society for Freshwater Science. And lucky enough, after uh, close to about 10 years of us pushing this program, primarily with funding from the society, we reached out to the National Science Foundation and were fortunate to get funding to expand our program to not just support undergraduates, but also to support graduate students and early career professionals in an iteration or expansion of the program called Emerge. So, so now we have two programs. We have the InStars program that is primarily funding undergraduates. And for the last two years, we've had the National Science Foundation support uh, to develop this Emerge program to broaden participation and leadership in freshwater science. And you can see out here some of our first uh, uh, classes that include, again, not just undergraduates, 
but also uh, graduate students, professionals, mentorship from like leaders in the society and, and some, some established career professionals. Uh, now, the, the program is, is exciting uh, because the support here, different than INSTARS, where it was just for the meeting, this support is year round. So, so we are for providing programming that is not just for people to attend the conference, but throughout the year, we do other activities that bring the students together either for a weekend or work collaboratively online uh, uh, to get professional development opportunities. Our first cohort, uh, which, which wrapped up in June of this year, had about 26 fellows. 11 of them were undergrads, 11 graduate students, about four early career professionals. Our second cohort, which is functioning right now, has 32 fellows, uh, a little bit less than undergrads, seven this year only, but 19 graduate students and six early career professionals. And again, we just closed our application for a third cohort, which starts uh, in May of 2023. And I'll tell you more about the program. For the most part is we're trying to build this uh, 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 opportunity or this network really fo focus on, on factors that might provide uh, uh, some form of integration and persistence in the field. So we're really looking at developing uh, activities that, that provide support, that build self-efficacy, also allows our participants to provide or, or build their own scientific identity, and also collaborate in what might be their shared values for staying in the field. And, and we're doing this with certain activities. I, I won't spend too much time in terms of like the, the framework, but really the type of activities that we provide. So for example, uh, once we have a cohort together, usually around uh, the timing for our annual conference, we take our participants in a float trip or a river float, usually somewhere near where the conference is gonna be at, and again, and a lot of times, this is an opportunity for them to learn about the natural history of particular systems, uh, particular rivers in an area they might not be at. But, but keeping in mind that a lot of our participants are meeting for the first time before they get on a, a, a canoe or a, a, you know, some, some sort of a mechanism to float down a river. So we do provide a lot of river safety training. It's an opportunity for bonding, for cohort building, and really to kind of learn from professionals about how to think about how we conserve particular ecosystems in, 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 in a region where we're visiting already. Uh, we do, of course, still bring students to the conference. So we spend time at the annual meeting. Of course, last couple of years, this last year, we met in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Prior to that, of course, the pandemic limited us to having virtual meetings. So we use a platform called Gather or Gather Town, where we do a lot of our collaborative work throughout the year. Uh, we also provide two workshops across the year, one in the fall and one in the spring, a fall workshop that centers on data analysis using NEON data. NEON is the National Ecological Observatory Network. So another large network of sites and resources and, and, and we use uh, uh, data analysis and software called R, which is open framework and available uh, for free to, to anybody that could, that could access and download into a computer. Then our second workshop in the spring is more centered on visual communication, science communication, kind of graphic design or strategies for developing posters, presentations, really providing a visual illustration, also using open framework or open science uh, software to be able to present their science. And th these are, this are workshops where we are bringing our participants or our fellows together at a site, typically for a weekend, about four days or so. And a lot of times we center them on those LTER sites, those long-term ecological research sites that, that I mentioned earlier, I was so excited about. And then of course, throughout the year, uh, these groups meet monthly, uh, just a typical Zoom meeting like this one where they get to work on particular tasks or get to attend webinars or meet with uh, professionals. We bring in usually speakers or provide kind of career day, kind of career day approaches to learning from, from scientists and professionals in different venues. And again, and we're doing this to maintain the engagement from our participants across the year before they get to come into trips where they all get together. Again. Now, uh, a lot of links, a lot of uh, potential ways in, in which you could kind of check out uh, how to find out more about the program. I am gonna show you the website uh, here in a little bit and, and hopefully show you a video. 
Uh, but the key is that, that this is possible by collaborating with a lot of potential venues. The Society of Freshwater Science is our, is our platform or our host society for it, but we are depending on funding from the National Science Foundation. We do have a partnership with a nonprofit called Freshwaters Illustrated that, that does videos and documentaries. And again, there's other partners that have allowed us to provide programming uh, for our students. And, and uh, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for one second. And then let's see if I could kind of share it again. I want to try to show you, let me see if this works. Uh, let's see, I am gonna, I'm gonna share my sound. So hopefully this is something that, that you can hear uh, and then maybe manipulate the sound in your own computers. But this is a little video from our program. Finding out what's available to me was really the, the biggest challenge. At my um, undergraduate institution, I didn't even know the field of freshwater science existed. I never really knew what a career in ecology could look like. It looks tree frogs, but I don't know. And I've... You know, from the beginning, there's already a whole bunch of, of doubt, you know? Um, from the very start, you, you aren't sure, is this, is this the way I want to go? Is this field kind of an option, really, for people like me? I got really discouraged. Um, I was so discouraged that I actually decided I didn't want to do science because um, I didn't think I had a future in it. The truth of the fact is that there, there are people, you know, like myself out there who are, who are rising up the ranks in science. There are people who are making changes and making a difference. Scientific fields, I think they do better if you have more input from, from more different groups. I think just seeing the diverse array of fields in uh, freshwater science and actually seeing those like act in action rather than just, you know, sitting and hearing about it, like going out into the field with them. Just to see the am amusement and how everybody gets excited about different aspects of fresh water. It's been really nice to feel like I belong and of course there's the fresh water blended in there but I, I feel like I found a home in Emerge. It has helped me overcome the challenges that I think would have otherwise caused me to give up sooner rather than continue moving forward. It may help me feel more validated going further in my career, knowing that there's gonna be like a support system or like a family that's gonna support each other. It's helped me appreciate more that, that I am the next wave of a scientist. You know, this is the next generation of people that are gonna be making these decisions and informing the world about what's gonna happen, what is happening. I think that anyone can find their way and it's it's just about persistence and looking for more opportunities and emerge as that perfect opportunity for some people. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second again. I get back to my regular screen. Let's see. But yeah, but that that's that's a little bit of a premise of, of our program and, and you know what we're trying to do with this program to provide opportunities for students. Uh, again, I, I've been I've been fortunate enough to work and had the opportunity to work with a lot of like minds uh, through the Consortium for Aquatic Scientific Societies. This are this is a group of nine scientific societies that have similar programs or, or allow opportunities for us to expose and promote and, and, and provide information about these opportunities. Uh, we just got back a couple of weeks ago for doing this uh, at the SACNAS conference in Puerto Rico. And, and hopefully we continue to work with this, this society. These are nine societies here from the American Fisheries Society all the way to the North American Lake Management Society. We are providing exposure to programs like Emerge or other programs that are providing resources for students, for professionals, for, for again, early career scientists 
to, to continue their good work in the field. So I think with that, because I know we're, we're kind of getting uh, towards, towards that, uh, that hour, I'll stop right there and, uh, and we'll be happy to, to answer any questions uh, that, that anybody might have. And thank you. Thank you for, for your time. Well, I definitely want to say thank you uh, for, you know, for your talk today. You know, it's, uh, I think it's really great support that you were able to show your career path on how you got here and um, your insecurities um, that you talked about. Because I think like a lot of students, you know, I go through that insecurities myself too. And I'm pretty sure other students go through that too, you know, like being a minority students, like not feeling that you can be able to, you know, get to that career path. So I think that was like really great that you were able to talk about. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, no, that's usually, that's usually something that, that, you know, we, we usually just leave on the, on the back burner, right? Like uh, our, our are those opportunities that we're not necessarily uh, uh, jumping for or reaching out for, is it because of something that we think we might not necessarily be the right person for, for something that, that might be relatively uh, 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 common or, or relatively artificial? and the instars um have you been able to like keep track of the students you know how they've been in the progress uh since they've been part of the you know uh, the program yeah abs absolutely so so one of the things that we've been really fortunate about particularly with instars from from the first cohort in 2011 or so is that we continue to to, to track and engage most of them and and a good thing for us is that many of them remain in the field or remain in the society and found found other lines of support, but also returned to the program as mentors. So, so one of the success stories for instars and emerge is that a lot of students that were participants as undergraduates are now participants as either mentors. We have folks from some of the original classes of instars and the pictures that I that I showed that uh, that are now in our advisory board. Again, you know, 11 years uh, uh, has been uh, quite, uh, quite a journey for many of those students that were probably going to their first meeting and has since continued or employed. Some of them have finished PhDs and have like academic positions elsewhere is, is definitely probably the, the, the highlight of what the program has been over, over a little bit over a decade. Um, do any of you guys have any questions for Checo? Hi, Checo. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for your sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. And I see there's there's a question. There's a question in the chat. If I know any specialists on seawater rise who can work on projects and proposals. Uh, based in Southern California. Yes, so that's that's a great yes. question. Yeah, one of one of the things that that uh that I find uh to be a good uh resource in the scientific societies is that usually they provide you a network of experts in, in, in various areas, I mean, in various uh, 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 fields. And the Society for Freshwater Science has a chapter in uh, a California chapter where, where it provides now links and exposure to some of the professionals in these networks. Now, and that's, that's not unique of, of freshwater scientists. Some of the societies in this, this consortium of, of aquatic science societies also provide that same link. I could think of one in particular, uh, the, 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 I guess like SURF or the Co Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation that tends to have a good source of members in the West Coast. Uh, Anita is a member. She could probably tell you about some of the resources and folks that might be in that area. And right now, because of, of the predictions or what we expect uh, with a change in climate, there are going to be a lot of folks focusing on sea level rise, uh, saltwater intrusion, potential shift in ecosystems, uh, uh, again, that, that are probably going to become a, a lot more common than, than, than it's been in the past. A good example for that is we just had here in Georgia our first 
a first hurricane uh, in, in Florida and Georgia, a first hurricane to, to make landfall in the month of November in over 35 years. So, so something, something to think about as we look into the future. I got a question from, from Alexis. Oh, th thank you, Alexis. Uh, yeah, very welcome. You did an REU as well. Very good. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Where was your REU, uh, uh, Alexis? If you get a chance to tell us in the chat. She's also here with me in the car. <laughs> oh, she's also in the car. Okay, she could tell you. <laughs> where, was, where was Alexis' REU? Where was your REU? Um... Oh, uh, one of them was at the Rocky Mountains Biological. In Rumble, Station? yeah, yes. Rumble, yeah. That's that's a that's a great place, and 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 with some of the great people that that are that are helping in a leadership way uh, to to continue to to move forward the REUs. Dr. Ian Billings out there, and and some other good folks. Uh, I I'm sure you had a great experience out there in the Rocky Mountains. And hopefully, uh, uh, you know, a, a pitch for, for those who, who still have the opportunity to apply for those type of programs. And even if you're not an undergrad anymore, you say like, oh, man, well, maybe I, I missed my chance. I'm graduating this year. Uh, there are going to be new opportunities. There's new opportunities that just started right now. There's a program that is similar to the REU uh, for, for postbacs. It's called, it's going to be called the RAMP program, R-A-M-P. And the first cohorts of ramp postbacks, those are students, if you're graduating now or in May and, and you think that, you know, maybe getting a gap year where you continue expo exposure into science, those programs are going to be about 12 venues uh, across the U.S. Uh, from, you know, from California. I think Cal Berkeley has one all the way to Puerto Rico. Uh, there are going to be opportunities recruiting 10 students per program starting in uh in in the summer summer 23 so so keep an eye on those as well uh happy to send more information about those if you're interested but that's for students that are finishing their undergraduate uh either now or or in may there are going to be opportunities for for one year kind of gap year post -backs. information i didn't even know that New information. Yes. <laughs> there are more questions for Chaco. And thank you all. I mean, I, again, I see, I see, uh, you know, folks that that I know attending. I really appreciate uh, your your time and coming to listen to this. And Anita, as always. I appreciate uh, everything you've done to, to, to bring these folks together. And, and I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you and, and opportunities to, to really provide this information. Hi, Maxine. Thank you. Okay, so Maxine says, thank you, Dr. Treco. I love to hear other people's stories and background being first generation American um, of German immigrants and connecting with other young scientists. I recognize the settings in that image video. That's right, Maxine, Maxine that worked wrong. At, <laughs> Maxine worked at the Jones Center with Dr. Steve Galladay, who's one of the who's one of the folks uh, in the video. Uh, and, and, and again, and that's that's the good thing because it's been with a lot of partners. The Jones Center in in Southwest Georgia is uh, is a neon site, is a National Ecological Observatory Network site, and and we do rely on on those uh, those partners and those sources and that type of expertise. So Maxine had the opportunity to, to work out there after completing her, her undergraduate degree and, and had a chance to get gain more exposure out there at those type of sites. It's good to see you, Maxine. There you go. Fresh one. <laughs> Turn you into malacology. Very good. Oh, we might have lost Anita. We're on our own now. Sorry, I got, I got, uh, <laughs> I got lost. <laughs> um, Alexis did have another question for you. Um, she was favorite freshwater species that you have worked with. 
Say that again, Anita. Uh, what has been your favorite freshwater species that you have worked with? Uh, I, I love I love working with mayflies. Mayflies is is definitely you know my favorite order of uh of, of aquatic invertebrates. I think they're incredibly unique. They they spend most of their lifespan as immatures. And then when they emerge into aerial adults, they they uh they 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 die very quickly. They have just a purpose of, you know, having babies and, and putting more generations in the water. But when they are immature, they're incredibly exciting, incredibly diverse, not just taxonomically, but also functionally. So I do I do enjoy me some uh some some mayflies. But again, you know, many, many, uh, many other organisms have been fun. I mean, the 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 dragonflies and damselflies are also very exciting. They're 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 predatory as as immatures and also as adults. They're, they're there's yeah there's there's a lot of unique uh, uh, aquatic invertebrates that I that I enjoy working with. And now through my students, I I learn a lot more because I get to I well I shouldn't say I get to work, but uh but but maybe maybe uh through their experiences I I get to to see work with other organisms like like amphibians and fish and and so on and so on. I did have another question for you. Um, so, you know, because you said that you went back to Puerto Rico as a postdoc to do research. Um, yeah. Now, since you're a professor, um, have you had an opportunity to go back to Puerto Rico and do research and help um, under my, you know, students there as well? Yes, so I was fortunate enough that the work that I did as a postdoc, I was able to bring uh, to, to Georgia Southern when I started here and uh, at, at the very early part of my career. And that allowed me to recruit students from Puerto Rico to, to work with me at Georgia Southern and likewise students from Georgia Southern that spend time at Puerto Rico with me. And actually students from elsewhere, one of, one of my very first students, Nick Macias uh, from California, he worked with me in Puerto Rico uh, and then after finishing his master's degree, returned to California to work for uh, uh, at San, at San, at San Luis Obispo for Cal Poly for a little bit before coming back to Georgia Southern, where he is an instructor now. So, so yeah, we've gone back to the island uh, right now. I, I don't have any projects on going at the island. I've continued to recruit students there, but, uh, but I do anticipate through programs like Emerge, and uh, programs like Instars to to continue to stay connected with uh, with the island, whether it's on research or in recruiting. I mean, like I said, we just came back from Puerto Rico on a on a on a large recruitment effort uh, at the SACNAS conference, and hopefully that brings more more students uh, into into this venue. Are uh, the last minute questions? in case you're adding it in the chat. <laughs> so if there isn't any other questions for Checo, I really would like to thank you guys for attending today's talk. And thank you, Checo, you know, for, you know, being our, our expert series for today. You know, like I definitely didn't learn a lot from you and, you know, not just today, but like from here. Um, and it was, it's been really great to get to, um, to see all the work that you have done. Thank you, Anita. It was a pleasure. And, and, and thank you everybody for, for your time and for listening. And, and again, uh, you can continue, uh, uh, continued success, uh, to all of you and, and happy to engage with you all over email or over social media. Don't be a stranger. Feel free to contact me if needed. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet y'all. Y'all have a great day, great uh, rest of the morning or afternoon yeah. here in the East Coast. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat>